many tendencies of the contemporary communist left and their competing orthodoxies pose a dizzying question. How does anyone even begin to navigate the countless splinters and subdivisions between Marxists, Marxist-Leninists, Trotskyists, Marxist-Leninist Maoists, and so on, with most approaches already enmeshed in one of these tendencies, the answer given is often in the form of a theoretical argument, a claim to the legacy of certain historical movements, and a denunciation of all other tendencies as revisionist. That is, the answer is given in the form of a shadow boxing polemic. Over the next few minutes, we hope to outline the basis for a more useful approach. To do so, we will consider the example of the revisionist controversy in the early German Social Democrat Party, or SPD, giving an outline of how to consider Marxist orthodoxy and revisionism, the real historical and material bases of these phenomena, and the relationship between theory, organisation and practice. We urge you to take this conversation forward yourselves, and we've included materials to aid with an initial group discussion on the subject in the video description. Welcome to Approaching Marxism. As David McClellan discusses in Marxism After Marx, the origins of the revisionist controversy in the SPD can be seen as early as the Erfurt programme of 1891, the result of the First Party Congress following the repeal of the anti-socialist legislation of 1878 to 1890. The theoretical component of this platform, attributed to Karl Kautsky, committed the party to upholding a Marxist orthodoxy based on Marx's critique of political economy and the need for revolutionary change. However, its practical content, attributed to Eduard Bernstein, was entirely concerned with reformist demands for universal suffrage, freedom of expression and a progressive income tax. Following Engels's death in August 1895, the tension between these positions burst into the open. Bernstein putting forward a sustained assault upon Marxist orthodoxy in numerous articles and books. Through these pieces, he argued against swathes of Marx's work. Most importantly, Marx's theory that capitalist accumulation leads inexorably toward a greater polarization of classes, concentration of capital into monopolies, and breakdown. Though he did not respond until 1898, and even approved of some of Bernstein's approach, Kautsky eventually took up the defence of Marx, backed by the SPD's party chair, August Babel. As McClellan explains, the essential crux of these debates was a fundamental disagreement over reform and revolution. By arguing against Marx's theory of class polarisation and breakdown, Bernstein was asserting an evolutionary or reformist road to socialism. Practically, this meant pursuing alliances with Germany's bourgeois political parties to exert pressure for reform, leaving class struggle and revolution behind. In defending these theories and the SPD's Marxist orthodoxy against Bernstein, Kautsky was asserting the need for revolutionary change. As such, revisionism was an attempt to argue for a reformist approach by means of correcting Marx. The SPD's orthodoxy positioned itself in defence of Marx's revolutionary politics, the inevitability of capitalism's collapse, leaving the party with the option of revolution or the common ruin of all classes. The resulting controversy lasted until the 1903 Dresden Congress, with Bernstein and the revisionists unsparingly denounced. It established revisionism as a category of opportunism in Marxist thought, a way of perverting communist politics from within, and illustrated the need for a revolutionary orthodoxy to combat it. Orthodoxy and revisionism thus emerge 
as dialectically entwined. Why the revisionist controversy developed cannot be grasped without an understanding of its material basis. As James Joel illustrates in his 1956 book, The Second International, 1889-1914, the essential dilemma faced by the SPD was common to the European Socialist Movement. With the success found in building mass parties through the latter half of the 1800s, how could the movement now function and preserve itself within a system it sought to destroy? As each of the parties within the Second International put forward their answers, they compelled the others to find their own. In France, Italy and Belgium, this confrontation played out relatively straightforwardly. Alliances with bourgeois parties formed as a way to preserve political liberties in the midst of political crisis and advancing reaction, or as a strategy toward universal suffrage. This was possible as each of these nations was ruled by a bourgeois parliament capable of passing legislation. Germany was not. Due to the failure of the 1848 bourgeois revolution, the Reichstag remained subordinate to the imperial government and the Kaiser. Though they needed its approval for legislation and the annual budget, this limited parliamentary action to the frustration of legislation or attempts to gain influence by forming alliances with the government or other parties closer to it. The SPD confined itself to the frustration of legislation, categorically ruling out alliances with other parties. Combined with the impact of the anti-socialist legislation, which had repressed trade union activity but allowed the party to continue to function, this left the SPD in the unique position as an opposition of non-engagement in Parliament and an ideologically dominant force over the workers' movement. As the new left theorist Peter Nettle argues in his 1965 paper, The German Social Democratic Party, 1890 to 1914, as a political model, the social basis of the controversy can only be grasped in view of this context. As the party grew, its bureaucratic sections became increasingly dominant, drawing more professionals into their ranks. Those used to working with the state among these sections, notably practicing lawyers and journalists, alongside trade union leaders and party members from the south of Germany, where the SPD could inform local policy due to different legal conditions, formed the social basis for revisionism. In contrast, Nettle argues, the social forces allied behind Kautsky and the Marxist orthodoxy he defended drew from professionals dislocated from the state. For example, journalists working exclusively for the party press and disbarred lawyers, alongside dedicated Marxists and the Northern Party membership. This illustrates both the political and class lines drawn in the debate, as well as the importance of the question for the SPD's continued functioning as it split the party bureaucracy. Viewed in totality, the material basis of the revisionist controversy shows that the matter was not simply abstract theoretical jousting as it is often portrayed. Rather, it was an inevitable confrontation the result of a huge ensemble of international and national political pressures. The Austrian Marxist Otto Bauer once described revisionism as the counterpart of vulgar Marxism, denouncing it alongside the SPD's orthodoxy 
in the same breath. Though McClellan offers a clear criticism of the core theoretical aspects of this orthodoxy in his account, Nettles' focus upon its practical failures and social basis gets to the heart of the matter. If the revisionist controversy was, in part, given life by the disconnect between theory and practice in the Erfurt programme, then it must also be stated that it did not resolve this question whatsoever. Having rejected parliamentary participation, party made no sustained efforts to develop a new revolutionary practice, instead consoling itself with a view that the collapse of capitalism would lead it to an axiomatic victory. Quite the opposite occurred. Capitalism incorporated the SPD. The basis for this rests in a split among supporters of Kautsky's position within the party's bureaucracy, between those professionals who earnestly believed in a revolutionary position and those who believed bourgeois society had cast them out. This latter section could be brought over to the assistance of the bourgeoisie by admittance to its society. With freedom of expression curtailed within the SPD through the early 1910s and the party coming out in support of the First World War at its outbreak in 1914, the revolutionary sections of the party began to reconsider the SPD's orthodoxy and its problems in earnest. The clearest criticism came from Rosa Luxemburg, who took aim at the party's inability to relate theory to action as the basis of its failure. Through various texts, she argued that the independent action of the masses could rejuvenate Marxist organisation. Though often dismissed as anarchism, by contrasting Luxemburg's positions with those of Lenin, Nettle argues that her emphasis was primarily a result of her conditions. Lenin faced the conspiratorial conditions forced upon the Russian left by Tsarism, which necessitated an emphasis on organisation as a prerequisite to action. Luxembourg faced a reality of organisational inertia, explaining her emphasis on the action of the masses. Though Nettle's binary presentation of the relation between action and organisation is undoubtedly reductive, it is enough to illustrate the crux of the matter. For the SPD, however, Luxembourg's critique came too late. With the split among its ranks consummated by the outbreak of war and the collapse conditions Kautsky had anticipated, the SPD became a bulwark of the bourgeois state, overseeing the suppression of the German Revolution of 1918. A party which had prided itself upon the formal defence of revolution organised the slaughter of those who dared to attempt it. The lessons of the revisionist controversy and the failure of the SPD's orthodoxy are cutting in relation to the contemporary left in the Northern Americas and Western Europe. However, these lessons cannot be mechanically applied. Instead of existing in a party culture, the revolutionary communist lefts of these regions are today a largely disorganized social milieu, peppered by sects, media platforms, and personalities. Rather than a singular contest between orthodoxy and revisionism, as in the case of the SPD, there are as many orthodoxies and revisionisms as there are Marxist tendencies. The product of these social formations and their contest is a subculture inexorably directed to its further fragmentation. Splits driven by the weight of the communist movement's history rampant sectarianism, an inchoate response to the depth of the contemporary capitalist crisis, and an increasingly anti-intellectual, navel-gazing theatre of cruelty in the movement's online spaces. This is not to denigrate the work done by individual activists 
or organizations within this milieu. But to stress that what campaigns and work they do find successes in tend to stand upon a fleeting social basis. Since at least the 1990s, the communist movement has found only temporary life in the spontaneous economic and political struggles of the workers and oppressed. Outside of this, it withers, its social reproduction dependent upon the theoretical contest of an inward-looking culture, limp orthodoxies and marginal sections of society. That theory is often held apart from practice is illustrated by this process. Given in blunt examples, it is striking that the COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and the economic and environmental crises racking the working class's conditions of life have all failed to produce lasting strategic adaptations among communists in Britain, our own context, despite the bitter fissures they have formed. To move beyond this requires much more than a theoretical struggle against revisionism, though it must contain this. As the example of the SPD shows, an orthodoxy dislocated from action is one distant from the revolutionary core of Marxist thought. However much it may formally defend what is revolutionary in Marx's economic and philosophical work. Lenin and Luxembourg's creative approaches to the relation between organization and action hold the kernel for any antidote to this malaise. To the communist, the proletarian and oppressed form the subject of any serious revolutionary movement. It is the task of a revolutionary orthodoxy to find the right organizational and political tools for them to liberate themselves through constant contact with their real struggles, evaluating its role realistically by its relationship to vast swathes of society. This is the real substance of Marxist theory and organization. Whilst this task is vast, we hope that this discussion has highlighted the core of an approach toward it. Now, it's over to you.